Today I'm going to be reading out aloud behind the scenes information related to the classic Doctor Who serial six-parter, mostly missing except for episode two, this one is episode four, The Abominable Snowman. The, you know, the working title for this story was The Abominable Snowman. Abominable is a needlessly difficult word for me to pronounce sometimes. I think I speak and read too quickly. In any case, this story saw the first appearance of the Great Intelligence. It would return later that season in The Web of Fear, but it would not make its next appearance until 44 years later in The Snowman. Today, this marks the longest interval between consecutive appearances by a character or alien race in the franchise's history. Only episode two of this six-part story exists in the BBC archives. As a 16mm black and white film teller recording, it was returned in 1982, having been recovered from the collection of a retired BBC projectionist. Episode 2 was shown alongside Episode 1 of The Web of Fear, then the only surviving episode of the serial, as part of BSB's Doctor Who Weekend in September 1990, under the banner of the Yeti Rarities. That's a, it's a great title. It's one of the most creatively, imaginatively seductive titles. The Yeti Rarities. It'd be a great band. Probably not, actually. The script did not describe the Yeti in any great detail, so costume designer Martin Bauer decided that they should have a bear-like appearance and be covered in thick fur. That's, I mean, that's fairly apt to for, for what the Yetis are alleged to look like. The costumes were built over a bamboo frame padded with foam rubber and sprayed with black paint. Deborah Watling named this as her favourite story, in part due to the experience of working with her father. According to Jack Watling, one of the actors playing the Yeti fell hundreds of feet during filming and was feared dead but was merely inebriated and fortunately cushioned by the foam rubber inside the costume. Wow, no wonder they didn't want to let that story out. <laughs> Health and safety. A shot of Padmasambhava's wizened head melting was considered too horrific and went unused. Oh, and has definitely lost for sure, probably. Filming in Wales was so cold that Fraser Hines was, wore rolled up trousers under his kilt. You'd have to. Deborah Watling claimed to have suggested her father Jack Watling for Professor Travers. She told the Radio Times in 1973 that the first sight of him in his beard called just both of them to corpse. This was the first story to not have any created background music, with chanting being used to create atmosphere. And that's what helps. That is it. Yes. That's what helps really drive the atmosphere home in these. True, true, true. There is no, there's no electronic score. Fascinating. That's gorgeous. That's genius. This is the first story to have the new theme arrangement for the end credits instead of the original theme for any second Doctor story. The next time the theme would be used would be in the Spearhead from Space. It has been reported that the animated reconstruction of this story is going to be the last Doctor Who animation due to BBC America withdrawing their funding. However, neither BBC America or BBC Studios have confirmed nor denied these claims. David Spencer was Victor Pemberton's partner. The production was beset with rainfalls, which delayed filming for two days and caused the crew to work on what was supposed to be their rest day. The rain also ensured that there would be no snow on the ground, which Gerald Blake, the director, had hoped would sell Snowdonia as a stand-in for the Himalayas. The ground was instead muddy and slippery, causing trouble for the actors, particularly those in the Yeti costumes who found themselves falling frequently. For episode 6, a regular Yeti costume was used with its bamboo frame and extra stuffing removed. As well as being the only surviving episode, the original 35mm film inserts for episode 2 still exist in the BBC archives, but the film inserts for all the other episodes is sadly thought to have been destroyed. For the latest DVD and Blu-ray release of the serial in animated form, the surviving episode has been remastered using these original inserts, making it not only one of few stories produced in the black and white era to have original surviving film elements, but one of few to use said elements to create a perfectly high picture quality for its home media release. Very similar to The Wheel in Space, the only known copy of The Abominable Snowmen to not have been confirmed as destroyed is the print sent to Nigeria. Given the enemy of the world and the web of fear, except for episode 3, which is disappeared before its shipment to the BBC, are both recovered from the country and the abominable snowman wasn't, its fate is mysterious. It was possibly sent to another country off record, or the episodes were obtained by private collectors. Henry Lincoln knew Patrick Troughton as they previously acted together in several plays. After Troughton had started on Doctor Who, Lincoln encountered him on the streets of Kew and learned that the actor was frustrated by the lack of stories set on Earth. Having read the completed scripts for this serial while on holiday in France, Troughton sent Lincoln a postcard which read, Superscript specially, number six, very happy, thank you, do some more please, Pat T. Before choosing the Yeti as a monster, Henry Lincoln considered writing a script about the Loch Ness Monster. Mervyn Heisman and Henry Lincoln were keen to caption 
Tibetan culture accurately and so used authentic names and details. Padmasa Bhava was an 8th century Buddhist master who was invited to Tibet by its king, Trisong Detsen. Krisong was an alternative transliteration of Trisong. Songsten and Ralpachan were named for the forever Tibetan monarchs. Yeshe Rinchen was a Tibetan imperial perceptor. Sapan was another name for the Buddhist scholar Sakya Pandita, both hailed from the 13th century. And Fon Mi Sabota was a 7th century figure traditionally held to be the creator of the Tibetan script. Songsten originally had the more authentic name Song Tsen. The production spent six days filming in Snowdonia. This is the longest location filming the series had experienced at the time. And I think we'll close it there. Thanks again, my good and dear friends. Appreciate it immensely. Tune in next time for episode five. Who knows what we'll do there? It'll be a surprise, I suppose.